Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you some of our uh, findings uh, upon uh, analysis of leadership amongst uh, Canadian academic surgeons. Um, it's my pleasure as well to work, uh, introduce you to Daniel Skarlicki, who's the Edgar Kaiser Chair and Professor of Organizational Behavior and Human Resources at the Sauter School of Business. Uh, this morning's uh, talk will uh, have a bit of a broad overview. We'll talk a little bit about leadership that Daniel will set the stage for. We'll talk a little bit about leadership in healthcare, why it's changing, why it's important. Uh, look at the research, look at the data, uh, and close with how we cultivate and develop leadership and draw some conclusions. There are some learning objectives to characterize the demographics, education, and academic background of current leaders in Canadian academic surgery. Uh, to put a bit of a urologic spin on this for this audience and to see how leadership integrates with the CanMed's uh, physician competency framework. Great. Pass the uh, stage over to Dan to carry on, set the stage this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, they keep us pretty busy there, so we don't get out much. So I'm very happy to be here for, uh, for a 7 o'clock start. Although we're, our, our presentation is going to be uh, about uh, people, individuals who take formal roles as leaders, we also want to acknowledge that leadership is, is more than that. Uh, by definition, we mean individuals, a process by which people exert influence over people, inspire people, uh, direct their activities to achieve group uh, and organizational goals. But it's much more than that in terms of it's, uh, it takes a lot of courage it takes to take the responsibility to try to make a difference. And, um, and so it's a verb. It's what people do. And so people can step in and out of their role as a leader. Um, and everyone in the organization can lead, provided they have certain skill sets and certain, um, certain uh, understanding of what needs doing. And so, just to help us in, in the definition, we want to distinguish two, between two aspects. One is what we call management, which is doing things right, getting things done, executing strategy, meeting budgets, doing the recruiting, those kinds of systems, which is different from leadership, which is doing the right thing, creating a vision, trying to lead change, uh, understanding how important it is to change the status quo, and it's about more also thinking about the future. And what, we've, what we're learning when we're in their study of leadership is, is we need, for organizations, uh, in particular healthcare, to be successful, we need both. We need both management and we both need leadership. Uh, but we're discovering that most organizations in healthcare are overmanaged and underled. So here's an example of uh, Jim Collins' work, and he talks about management, and your goal as a manager is to, pr to produce predictability, to try to, um, uh, try to do a lot of planning and organization. Uh, leadership, on the other hand, uh, is, is the chief passion officer, is the person who tries to motivate, align people through understanding and executing a sense of purpose, a sense of uh, and a vision. Now, when I was younger, healthcare was a hospital and with maybe 30 or 40 uh, uh, health uh, healthcare professionals. Today, it's a business. We're talking about millions and billions of budgets. We're talk, uh, dollars in budgets. We're talking about um, uh, tens of thousands of employees. Uh, we're talking about you know, a multitude of locations, several hospitals, and so on. So it's no longer a single entity that's focused on healthcare. There's a lot of business of healthcare. Uh, and as Thomas Lee argues, the problem with healthcare is that people like me who learn medicine when it was more of an art and less science. And he argues that healthcare today needs a fundamentally new breed of leaders. Uh, <clears throat> so what does that look like? Uh, well, in the, in the past it was about treat and cure, today it's about prevention. Uh, disintegrated care, now it's about coordinated care. Uh, it used to be physician-led, now it's about team-led. Uh, it's, it, we used to be about, m my chief did it that way, that's how I do it, and now it's shifting over to evidence-based. Uh, and I won't read through all of these, uh, but again, and particularly the back one, uh, the, lo the bottom one is about book learning taught by the professor, see one, do one, teach one, and now it's all about e-learning, and it's about simulators and case-based learning. So the process of how we develop leaders has considerably uh, changed as what they do. And so when we think about... Um, 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 what, what we're learning, what, are, what is it that leaders are really needing today? 
that might be different uh, than what we, we've seen in the past. And uh, I would argue that this isn't that different, but here's the things that we're learning. Number one is we must have an integrative perspective. All too often in healthcare, we're working in silos, different departments, different divisions, and not only we don't know what the other part others are doing, we actually can't communicate with them. We don't have a sense of similarity of understanding what they're doing or, or actually do we care in, in many cases. So we need to understand the integrative perspective. Of course, team skills, we can't just assume that that our leaders understand and have these team skills uh, just because they've been on a team. There's, there's certain training that goes along with that. Uh, conflict resolution skills, I mean, reasonable people disagree. And for us to maximize and really understand how to make quality decisions, that comes with that. That's what we need. We need people who can negotiate, particularly in the healthcare field. It's a very political environment, and we need our skill, our leaders, to be able to handle themselves in those kinds of environments. Business acumen, things like finance and, and operations and human resources and performance management and all those kinds of things are absolutely critical. In fact, when we were doing a, a similar uh, presentation yesterday to Vancouver Coastal Board of Directors, uh, their, their greater concern was just some basic fundamental uh, business acumen was often uh, seen as, as more urgently critical. Authentic leadership. By this we mean um, is that when the storm starts to brew, um, what do we do? It feels like you're out in a boat without an anchor. When, when the crisis and uncertainty hits, what do we do? Is we end up rowing faster. When we really need is to understand our values because our values become our rudders. They help us understand what direction we're going. So we, in, in, this, in this piece, we mean we really can't lead others until we lead ourselves. And the values that we're coming, that are seem to be coming, uh, be, that are percolating up over the last few years that we're seeing in the leadership uh, regime is um, humility. Why is humility important? It is because when I'm humble, I can see greatness in others. Another one is the, the value of courage, because courage is, and people often argue that courage is the number one value, because when you're courageous, uh, you're more willing to do the right thing, and you're more willing to... Uh, uh, even though it's an unpopular uh, decision. I'm sorry, is there, is there a hand up? How do you become, how are you humble to become a leader? You know what, um, that's, uh, that's not quite as, uh, as opposed as, po as you might think. In fact, the most su successful leaders that we're seeing aren't those people who are leaping off high, high buildings. Those are the people who are actually on the shop floor, listening to people, really acknowledging that other people on their team have something to contribute. And without a sense of humility, that's really hard to access. So people we're discovering, people who are low on humility aren't making themselves available to all the information that's around them when they're making decisions, when they're going through their day. Uh, and we're surprised, because you're right, that the classic uh, understanding of a leader is the person who makes the calls. But a truly humble person would not seek leadership. Oh, actually, that's not that's not the case. In fact, when we're doing some of the some of the most successful organizations today are people who are very led by people who you would never pick them out of a crowd, and yet they are they are running successful organizations even through the most uh, through the most tumultuous times. Look at you, Marty. You've been a leader for decades, and you're the humblest guy I know. I think without egotic drive, why would you want to be a leader? Because they're not mutually exclusive. That's, the, that's, that, that's what we're learning. And what we're also learning in, in one of the classic books on this is a book called Good to Great. And this is a book by Jim Collins who analyzed the top, top organizations and determined what was, what's different about the most top successful organizations in the world. And they were surprised that these top organizations were not led by, uh, were not who you would expect and they weren't led by who you would expect. And so it's, it's new. The other important part is today we must be able to understand, uh, we've got to be creative, we've got to be innovative, we've got to find new ways of, uh, of uh, providing a patient care, lowering costs, and that's really about, we've got, to be, uh, uh, we've got to be understanding how important that is to our role. And why that's uh, also something of a, a seemingly contradiction, because evolutionary psychology would predict that under crises and when uncertain times, uh, human beings tend to narrow their focus and hunker down 
at the very time when we need people to open up and understand uh, their, their environment better and look for new ways of doing things. And so, <clears throat> although I think we all know that there's a, there's a storm looming on the horizon, we also want to alert that we, we call it the perfect storm. Uh, of course, we know there's aging population who are going to take a lot out of the system, uh, in particular over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, healthcare spending is, at a, is being capped. We'll talk a little bit more detail in later in our presentation. <coughs> and a later labor shortages. We know within the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be losing 20% uh, of our of our healthcare professionals uh, just through uh, through retirement. Uh, but again, uh, I'm going to turn this over. But but our key th our key we talk about the you know the the, the the gravity of the conversation is that we've got a lot of spending going on. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, but what we want to argue is that the C-suite of health authorities cannot do it alone. We need physicians and as partners in terms of physical prudence. And uh, we're going to I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, uh, ju uh, just so I don't have to answer that question. I'll hand it over to Jack Ball. No. Yeah, and of yeah. course, not at all. In, in the slide before, you talked about the values and effective leadership. Is it sort of a in a, in a successful organization where you have a leader and a manager, is it a yin and yang kind of thing where you have a humble leader but a, a not more outgoing manager and you know, courage and inversely we, proportional to the position they well, um, yes. We've seen some very successful companies uh, when we examine the leadership team. There is the person who's really focusing on what we call kind of the external person who's focusing on the vision and making sure that we've got the secure the resources that we need. And there's somebody else who's dedicated to making sure the operations internally are managed well. So that's one model, but not necessarily. There's many, many right ways of doing this. But it seems to be that in, in healthcare, we really do... Uh, we do tend to focus on the operations and getting our own department running well uh, when there's a sense to see the bigger picture. And I think that's the, that's the part where we want to spend a little time on this morning. Check that. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Daniel. D to the question earlier, and, and Dan acknowledged it uh, with respect to uh, the work by Jim Collins, uh, you know, your point is, is very valid. You would think that that would be a paradox, uh, a humble leader. Uh, but when he, when Jim Collins looked at at, uh, at leadership, he he characterized it based on, and he he could break the leadership down into five different levels, and and I'd encourage you to read read the book. It's it's a, a bestseller, etc. Uh, but he would characterize those people as level five leaders, and his description of them was uh, fierce resolve, but uh, utter humility, and so. And so people that have been uh, have risen to the top, and, and he, the metrics he used was not just um, you know, earnings per share and stock performance. It was the success of the company, um, the, the longevity of the company, the culture that the company had, the employees and how they enjoyed working for the company. And all of these variables were put together to come up with that hierarchy. And, and again, it's, it's paradoxical, but I mean, he, he acknowledges that in the, in the book as well. So uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, we were talking a little bit about about healthcare spending in Canada. You know, it's 11.7 percent of GDP in 2009. Uh, it's certainly up to 13 or 14 percent by 2011. In the United States, they're predicting a GDP of 20 of uh, 20 percent by by 2020. Uh, certainly, we're at 50 percent of the healthcare budget. So I mean, certainly this is this is a front burner issue. Um, as Daniel said, the, the C-suite cannot do it alone. Uh, physicians, this this metric comes from Kai High and OECD data. Uh, physician salaries and billings very consistent over the years between 12 and 16 percent of direct health care costs and this is generationally consistent if you look at the Kai high data and and the OECD will tell you that the decisions that physicians make uh, cost the system between 70 to 80 percent of indirect health care costs and so you know really the target audience you could make the argument is 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 the physician group and you know it's not just the physician group that that has this on the radar um, uh, CanMeds does. Look at our certification bodies. Uh, if you look at the CanMeds DAISY, we won't go through all of the seven characteristics, uh, pardon me, six characteristics, but if you look at the, uh, the last two, professional and manager, um, CanMeds feels that having managerial skills is on the radar. This is no different than the ACGME when I worked in the United States. Uh, they have uh, six core competencies and the one that fits most uh, uh, in keeping with that of a manager is that of systems-based practice and knowing the system, know how to, to manage the system, know how to navigate the system, uh, practice cost-effective care, uh, partnership with healthcare managers. 
um, again, you know, as educators, are, are we uh, are we doing a good enough job of of promoting that that skill? Uh, it dovetails quite nicely with the work that uh, Michael Porter has uh, has written on in the New England Journal. I again encourage you to read some of, of his work. He's had a whole series of articles uh, in the New England Journal about healthcare value, and he defines value as outcome versus cost. A little bit about Michael Porter. Michael Porter is a uh, is an economist, has a PhD, works at Harvard in the business school, uh, and teaches. Uh, and so, it, again, we'll talk a little bit about cross-pollination, but, but this is something that I think is, is most relevant. And it's a very simple equation. You can either enhance value by uh, improving outcomes or decreasing costs. And so, to, to tie that into what we're talking about in leadership, could an argument be made for better uh, value through enhanced leadership? Uh, we embarked on a research study with some of the plastic surgeons, uh, with uh, Daniel in our business school, uh, to really analyze uh, the current demographic of leadership trends in, in the Canadian academic surgery. Our hypothesis was that academic surgeons are promoted to positions of leadership based on their academic and or clinical record and not purely based on their leadership skills. So the data will, will comment on this hypothesis. Again, our purpose was to characterize the education, training, and academic background, uh, to perform a job analysis, which is a basic human resources tool of any job that people do, uh, and to determine some predictive variables of promotion. We obtained uh, UBC Research Ethics Board approval. Uh, it was an anonymous survey. Uh, 295 uh, email addresses of leaders in surgical academia in Canada were identified, and we identified these people as either depart department heads, division heads, or program directors. Uh, we did a little bit of statistics using descriptive as well as SPSS, uh, inf using, uh, uh, studying the inferential statistics. Um, we circulated this to the full gamut of anyone who works in an operating room uh, on the surgical side. And we had four main buckets of categories of questions that we wanted to, to learn the answers for, of uh, the demographics, the educational background, the practice profile, as well as their leadership role. We got a 36% response rate. And looking at the results, uh, on average, uh, looking across the board, again, breaking this down into division head and program director, um, on an overall basis, 88% male, 12% female, slightly uh, more females in the program director role. Uh, we're looking at people in their fourth and fifth decades, on average. Um, and looking at the ethnic background, it was uh, uh, primarily uh, uh, Caucasian. Uh, there's a body of evidence that would support that uh, taller people get promoted. And so we asked this question as well, how tall were you? Uh, the average uh, height of men was 5'11", average height of women was 5 feet 7 inches. Um, <coughs> most are married and most have somewhere between 2 and 3 children. Looking at their educational background and, and training, uh, the question that we asked here was really to see, you know, most people at, in academic centers uh, uh, are generally recruited either by doing more fellowships or having uh, an advanced degree. Um, and looking at the overall metric here, 60% had no advanced degree, 33% uh, had a traditional scientific-based uh, advanced degree, uh, either a Master's of Science, a PhD, a Master's of Education, or something of the like, while 7% had uh, a master's in, a, in the business realm, for example, an MPH, uh, MBA, a Master's of Healthcare Management, or a Master's of Health Administration. I uh, broke it down to look at the urology data as well, and 92% had no advanced degree, and 8% had an advanced uh, scientific degree. Uh, most people uh, performed their residencies in Canada, and the fellowship was generally split between Canada and the U.S. Again, breaking this down into the urology uh, cohort, uh, we've talked about uh, the advanced degrees in urology, um, and that's just a graph showing the same. Our responses were uh, from the full gamut of, uh, of surgical subspecialties. And looking at the, uh, you know, the question that was asked here uh, on the left side of the screen is, is how do you spend your time? Uh, what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And you can see that all leaders that were identified and that responded had a, a, quite a significant clinical role, greater than 50%. Uh, but the next most common way they spent their time was actually in their leadership role, so 20%. Uh, and then, of course, the other academic uh, side, uh, research, teaching, administrative, filled their, filled their time. Uh, most people in practice on average of 18 years and spending over 60 hours a week working. 
we next asked the question uh, of those leaders, um, based on how much time you spend in the week on your leadership position, how much of your income is, is being compensated for this? So we wanted to see if there was a delta, if there was any, any real difference. Um, so on average, um, the division heads have a, have a better negotiated agreement because they're getting 20% of their income from their leadership role um, and spending 23% of their time while there's a more significant delta with respect to the program directors. And then we wanted to uh, look at the leadership uh, uh, data uh, as it pertained to income in the urology cohort. And I must say that the urologists are doing a better job than the average surgeon of negotiating their income versus the time that they spend. So they're, they're a little bit narrower with respect to uh, income versus time. Uh, and then hours per week worked. Um, again, I, I don't know if this was total call hours or whatnot, but again, but just above 60 for the average surgeon and, and just below 60 for the average urologist. Three meetings per year and five weeks of vacation per year uh, across the board. And then as expected, um, looking at academic rank uh, of, of the different leaders, um, program directors were primarily assistant or associate professors, while uh, division department heads were primarily full professors or associate professors. Uh, the vast majority were Royal College certified and um, about 40% to 60% break with respect to clinical versus GFT with uh, more GFTs in academic uh, surgery. So again, to ask the question as it pertains to our hypothesis, uh, you know, are these people strong academic people? Uh, and you can see on average there's 47 publications across the board, 66 for the average division department head and 26 for the average program director. A uh, few book chapters authored and a few textbooks authored. We wanted to delve a little deeper into how where people are publishing and to see you know if people are publishing again you're spending close to 20 to 25 percent of your time in your leadership role are you also doing research in this field and and to ask the to look at the data uh, 60 percent almost 60 percent did not publish in any non-medical area and the next most common place to publish would be in education which was approximately 25 percent so about 17% 17, 17 of people have published either in the areas of leadership, uh, business, or interpersonal um, skills types of publications. Uh, looking at the publication mix for the urology cohort, uh, a few publications in the business world, but the vast majority, above 70%, were in, in, uh, in non-medical, uh, pardon me, primarily medical areas. So more about the leadership uh, role and, and how their, uh, the skill set was the next set of questions. Uh, on average, people were promoted in their, in their 40s, and they've maintained their leadership position for an average of about five years, which would, keep in keeping, which would be in keeping with the Canadian University model. Uh, most were promoted rather than recruited. And again, if you read Jim Collins' work, uh, great leaders were promoted rather than recruited. Uh, and most were uh, appointed uh, on a permanent basis. Looking at, uh, at what size and scope of, of a department uh, or division that, that the leaders were managing was the next set of questions. And so on average, close to 30 faculty members in, in, in the department and the number of staff that are managed are close to 50 people. So it's not an insignificant uh, number of people that uh, the division department head were responsible for, or, or even the program director. If you look at purely the division head, department head, 77 people that were they were directly managing. We next asked what the, on a subjective basis, what was the most important professional characteristic that led you to your promotion? And uh, interestingly, most people responded that they thought they were good teachers and good and, and delivered good patient care, and that's the reason that they were promoted. We next asked what the most important personal characteristic was. Uh, a wide range of personal characteristics with no clear winner. Uh, most people felt they were team oriented or forward thinking. We wanted to know if, uh, if you were getting a clear direction as to what type of, of job you were appointed to or recruited into. Uh, program directors fared a lot better than the division or department heads. They were provided with a job description uh, greater than 50% of the time. And, Again, that might be in keeping with the Royal College mandate of, uh, of, of really describing what your roles are. The division or department head only were given a job description 33% of the time. 
And this question uh, was, was again quite interesting with respect to what do you do on a, on a regular basis as it pertains to uh, your job description. And greater than 50% of respondents had a, a role to play with respect to budgeting, accreditation, fundraising, human resources, leadership, recruitment, retention, setting the mission or vision for the department or division, strategy, as well as mentorship. The greatest challenge that was described by leaders was related to time management about half the time and a conflict about a quarter of the time and conflict resolution. The final analysis we did here was related to uh, what were predictive variables of, of leadership. And again, our hypothesis was that uh, excellent clinicians or excellent uh, researchers were promoted. And in fact, our hypothesis was not supported by, by looking at this and putting all the numbers into uh, a logistic regression. The only variables that were significant for predicting a leadership role were being of male gender and uh, being uh, working a certain number of uh, years in practice and having a longevity uh, of work at that institution. So moving on to our discussion, uh, looking at uh, some of the findings and a little bit more granularity, uh, it became quite clear from this data that there certainly is a, a gender discrepancy. And in the business world, they refer to this as the glass ceiling. Uh, it's defined as despite increased uh, entry into fields historically held by men, females don't assume the top leadership positions with equal proportion. We wanted to compare this with what's happening with respect to the next generation. Uh, we looked at the CARMS data for the last decade. Uh, the CARMS data suggests that uh, just over one-third of, of females are entering surgical subspecialties, uh, while our data shows that only 12% across the board were. And if you look at the division or department head, only 4%. Uh, it's more encouraging at the program director level where there's 20% uh, of, of females in those roles. Breaking down the academic background in a little more detail, uh, looking at it objectively, <coughs> clearly, although it didn't reach statistical significance, a uh, majority of leaders do have a strong academic record, on average 47 publications. Very few publications in business or management, uh, and very few with a business or management advanced degree. However, subjectively, when you look at the, the responses, leaders feel that they were selected based on their clinical performance, uh, not their leadership skills or specialized leadership training. We asked the question about leadership challenges and what's the greatest challenge that you face on a regular basis. And the biggest areas that we were, were found were related to managing time, managing a changing uh, administrative or healthcare environment, and managing conflict. And a lot of these things can be correlated to the work Daniel Goleman has taught, taught to us. And he's written extensively on the concept of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence can be defined as the skill or ability to identify, assess, and manage the emotions of oneself, others, and groups. It's not an innate talent, but a learned capability. And a lot of the challenges that the leaders have experienced uh, relate to that of emotional intelligence. As we talked a little bit about Colin's work, most were promoted from within. Uh, it's disappointing that uh, job description and, and what the skill set that uh, the leader was required to have and the jobs that the, required, that the leader was required to be competent with was not really shared with the, with the new leader. Uh, and, you know, as we talked a little bit earlier, it's not an insignificant amount of, of people that you're managing at the division or department head at 77 people. The literature suggests that uh, when you have more than 50 people in your department, you should, you should have an HR manager, you should have someone that's responsible for the finance side. And again, our, our study did not ask those questions in significant detail, uh, but, but again, there might be a gap there. So the question that should be asked next is, could leaders be more effective with an enhanced skill set? Certainly there are a whole number of stakeholders that have a vested interest in the decisions that leaders make. Uh, I won't read all of these, but at the most, least and certainly most important, <coughs> the last but certainly not least person is of course our patients. So again, if this was a, a, a business uh, sales pitch or a, a business case we're presenting, we would talk about a value proposition. And the value proposition here is, would a better trained leader produce better value for the healthcare system? We do know from NISQIP and a lot of the sites around the Lower Mainland in, and in British Columbia have embarked on the NISQIP uh, process. 
Uh, and what we've learned from NISQIP is what gets measured certainly does get managed. Certification bodies clearly see it on the radar. CANMEDS as well as the ACGME have identified managerial and leadership skills as, as an important part of a trainee's job description. So the question that next needs to be asked is, you know, is, is it an acquired skill or is it an innate skill? Some believe that leaders are born and not trained. Are, le are surgeons natural leaders? We certainly steer the ship in the operating room. We manage our own practices. We are innovators. But the research, will be, the research is quite clear that leadership traits can be acquired. And if you read the work by Jim Cotter and others uh, published in the Harvard Business Review as well as the American Journal of Surgery, and the reference list is below, some leadership qualities are inherent, but all have the ability to improve their leadership skills. And it's very simple if you compare it to what we do in surgery. It takes us five years to train a competent surgeon on their investing time, they're studying, they're doing work, they're presenting. Uh, and they often do a fellowship, and certainly there's lifelong learning thereafter. It's the same thing in, in, uh, in you know, acquiring a new set of skills in the business world. I mean, if you do an advanced degree in the field uh, and focus your attention on it, you will improve those skills. And the concept of earned authority is, is along these lines as well. Earned authority is, is really the fact that leaders must be given the time and space to improve themselves. Leaders grow, they're not simply made. And I, again, we would, uh, I would um, draw a parallel between earned authority and the graduated responsibility in a surgical training program. You don't give the intern the scalpel to, to do a prostatectomy on the first day, but maybe the, the fellow will be able to do that for you. So again, whose mandate is it? Is it the government or the Ministry of Health to, to, uh, to push this on, uh, on people to develop more leadership? Is it the health authority or hospital? <coughs> is it the university or medical school? Is it professional organizations and surgeons? Certainly, there are siloed efforts at the present time. There's people that are sponsoring these things. There's universities that have programs in place. There's professional organizations that sponsor uh, leadership and, and other types of initiatives. And I guess the question is, how do we operationalize this role of training skilled leaders? If you look across uh, to Europe and look at the NHS, uh, they have something in place that they've had in place for a couple of years now, the Medical Leadership Competency Framework. Uh, they felt that there was a gap present there, and they have a curriculum in place, and they start the curriculum at the undergraduate level. They have postgraduate uh, training as well in this realm, and then for the practitioner. Uh, they also have uh, a framework that, that, that these uh, people that are working in NHS need to adhere to. Now, the UK model is certainly different than what we have in Canada. The UK model is, is that of an employer and administrator as well as a partner in education. So you could make the argument that it's easier to dictate change in that environment as opposed to, uh, you know, surgeons who are essentially independent contractors who might work uh, fee-for-service or might have a service contract in place. It's easier to dictate change when you have sort of one, one employer. So in conclusions, I think our hypothesis was supported in part. Um, clearly on the subjective side, on the objective side, there was maybe not enough N number to, to, to have the, the same uh, level of conclusion. Uh, this was a preliminary evaluation of leadership trends in academic surgery. We wanted to profile a leader, uh, determine what skill set was requisite, as well as look at some predictive variables of promotion. I, th I see this more as a talking point for those in administrative positions to invest in a collaborative effort. Uh, and then finally, the last point I'll make is, is that of, of cross-pollination. I think that, uh, you know, Jenny, for example, has taught us uh, that she's doing a master's in, in education research, and, and by taking some of those concepts, she's able to become a better teacher. Uh, we certainly have a great, a great relationship with people in biomedical engineering, and the engineering field has improved uh, the, uh, the specialty of surgery. Uh, I see uh, the role for cross-pollination. We have experts uh, in the business field that are, are certainly able to educate us on, on how to, to manage what we're doing here. Uh, and so I think cross-pollination is, is critical. There were some uh, limitations. This was an observational and cross-sectional study. Um, it did not include direct leadership from uh, health authorities and hospitals. Uh, some respondents did have secondary roles. Uh, but the question is, how else do we obtain this information? A survey is really the only way to, to glean this information. Uh, our sample size was small. 
Uh, and finally, we didn't correlate uh, these results with what's being taught in the medical school and, and residency. Certainly, when I finished my residency seven years ago, there was, there was no role to play with respect to learning about some of these skills, and not in medical school either. So, Daniel and I would welcome your questions or comments. Thank you.